let me just give you a sense of, and we should say in the Senate, there was an attempt to, um, I guess, call for sanctions and pass legislation on sanctions. Uh, Biden supposedly has all the authority he needs for sanctions in this instance. But I think the Senate wanted to get aggressive with it or at least show that they were behind the United States and that we were unified. And of course, we're not. The Republicans wanted to sanction Russia now for, uh, I guess, in the words of Lindsey Graham, for just, you know, being bad guys right um making us nervous the democrats wanted to do it uh, conditionally so that it is a um uh, deterrent to the russian invasion uh of ukraine and um they couldn't agree on what sanctions and so they passed a nine binding resolution saying that we broadly support Ukraine and its autonomy. And if the Russia were to invade, then sanctions could be imposed. There's really no need for a preemptive, like, see, we're going to do this. I mean, I think they understand that that would happen. Well, I mean, specifically, if there's legislation, too, like it, 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 it makes it uh, fairly incumbent upon the president to do it. So um, nevertheless, the the desire for conflict with russia or a desire for a conflict between ukraine and russia and we, and and again yes russia has been engaged in a conflict with ukraine for some time particularly uh when you look at the uh, uh crimea um and so this is not to say that um russia hasn't already invaded uh Ukraine. But in this instance, at this time, um, you want, or I, I, you want, I want, I, it would be my druthers, and I think it's the most humane um, uh, opinion to have is no conflict, no shooting, no killing. And um, that to me is the best case scenario. I cannot tell you the number of emails that we've had saying that, A, we don't understand the genuine threat from, uh, from Russia, or B, we don't understand that, it's, uh, that Ukraine is full of Nazis. Um, and the U.S. has been um, interfering with Ukraine in such a way as to uh, set something like this up. I, I think like, you know, there's validity to all of these takes. Yes. At the end of the day, none of them, in my mind, uh, require one cheer on a military conflict between these two countries. Um, and I mean, I don't, as far as I'm concerned, everybody involved in this, including us, are, um, are unworthy of our trust yeah. or our faith. Ukraine or, has their own set of incentives, and we were talking a little bit about the show. This helps in terms of fortifying their uh, their reserves of weapons and money if the United States does choose to send them arms and et cetera. Put up that tweet from Brank, yeah. uh, Branko March, Marchitek, uh, writer at Jacobin. Uh, we present this as a theory as to you know in part and, and none of this is comprehensive if you want a comprehensive analysis of the history of the united states and ukraine and the history of ukraine and russia my suggestion to you would be to find a podcast there are millions of mark goldberg does a great uh, podcast uh, uh on for on foreign uh policy uh, but there's a lot of different you can go and listen to uh mark ames uh you know you want to get a a well-rounded perspective you, there are you're going to have to do a lot more than listen to this show um ames is untrue and on if people want to track that though yeah and 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 i and i would li again i would listen to a lot of other podcasts uh i would never just listen to one when you want to get something that because the history goes back so far too because this really goes back to the bush administration 
frankly, the, the, probably the first Bush administration is uh, the, the uh, beginnings of this. Uh, but this goes back to uh, the Bush administration, the second, when he basically made a commitment to Ukraine to enter into NATO because at that time there was the ascendance of the neocons and they wanted to push this big time. Uh, but you could also look back to the Clinton years where we really dropped the ball in terms of, of helping Russia integrate into, into Europe or at least into the West on some level or at least into uh, the 90s. We sent our best economic minds over there. Exactly. So, I mean, there's, there, there's a lot going on here, but the bottom line is not having bombs and soldiers fire at each other and inevitably kill civilians is the one thing that I feel confident uh, as a, a message that we can deliver here with accuracy, which is hopelessly that would be a bad naive, thing. Hopelessly naive. Don't you know that Putin somehow withdrawing his true presence is actually probably secretly a bad thing? Here is a uh, Branko Markitex. Um, I believe it's Markitech. Yeah. Uh, um, tweet. Interesting theory. I think there's probably something to it. Uh, but pop this up. Um, oh, it's. I guess it's just off of uh, Simon uh, Schuster. Um, and who is Schuster? Is the is a, a reporter for time, time based in New York City by right. way of Moscow. Uh, sources close to Zelensky told me the U.S. first warned his team of a Russian invasion last fall, putting the chances at 80 percent. The Ukrainians didn't buy it, but they saw an opportunity, more aid, more attention and played along. Now they have regrets. Too much attention. So this was, um, you know, and uh, then. Uh, Mark Teach says this confirms what a number of analysts have argued last month that Zelensky manipulated the situation to get more weapons and aid and got buyers remorse when the resulting panic had economic consequences. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, that's I, probably I, partly true. I mean, I think Putin's desire for aggression and to chest puff, it, puff is true. And I also think it's true that the United States is over stating the urgency of the conflict all of these things can be true yeah yep um and the u.s press is also overstating the urgency of the conflict